to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Rena Glazer. Welcome back. Do you like listening to our show? We aim to inspire, teach, and sometimes entertain. If you're listening on iTunes or what's now known as Apple Podcasts, could you please take a moment to subscribe and leave a review? It's quick and easy to do. You could just leave a rating or add some comments, whatever you'd like. We'd appreciate the feedback, and it would make it easier for other listeners to find the show, spreading the word about pro bono and access to justice. Thanks so much for your help. Today, we're talking to Andrew Legrand from Gibson Dunn. Andrew's based in Dallas and is a member of the firm's litigation department. He also maintains an active pro bono practice, and we discussed how he combines the two. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Andrew, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Let's jump right in. To get started, could you tell us about you? Share a little about yourself and your background. Sure. I was, uh, was born in Brooklyn, New York, but, but raised in Arlington, Texas. I followed my oldest sister to the University of Oklahoma, where I got my bachelor's degree uh, in English and African American Studies. Uh, I taught for about a year. I taught uh, English in alternative school. Uh, and then I pursued my master's in education from Columbia University uh, Teachers College. Uh, from there, I decided to go to law school. Um, I studied law at Columbia Law School, and uh, frankly, I just I couldn't escape the law. While I uh, was a kid, I had the seed of uh, the law sort of planted in my mind from watching Perry Mason. Uh, it kind of dates myself there a little bit, but um, at Teachers College, I had a uh, focus in higher education policy and issues like access and equity uh, and affirmative action and the Civil Rights Act uh, were pretty prevalent in my studies. Um, so I decided to uh, to go to law school to pursue this passion that uh, I had for a long time. So let's come back to Perry Mason and the law in a moment. But I want to talk about making the transition from the University of Oklahoma to Columbia in New York City. And I, as someone who went to school up there and lived a block away from Teachers College and, and did that path uh, myself, although 116th and Broadway in that area is a lot different when you were there than when I was there. How was that transition from, from you know, Oklahoma to, to Manhattan? So the transition was fairly easy for me um, because I was born in New York and I uh, lived there for a little while and still had some family out there. So I kind of knew what I was getting myself into in terms of the hustle and bustle of the big city. Uh, and, you know, Oklahoma was a great place uh, to go to uh, college because it's, you know, back then it was a college town. It's grown significantly since I was there. But the transition was, was fairly sh- straightforward for me. Uh, I was married at the time, so my wife, uh, you know, came up with me and, you know, things worked out well really well. That's wonderful. So let's go back to sort of Perry Mason and your cultural and other influences. Tell me more about developing a a passion for the law and thinking that that would be a track for you. So as I mentioned, when I was a child, I just remember uh, watching uh, Perry Mason and, uh, you know, in the heat of the night, all these shows that my, my mom used to keep on uh, late at night when I was supposed to be in bed, I would, I would turn them on and, and, and watch them eagerly to figure out what was going to happen next. I didn't really think I would pursue law as a kid. It was just one of those things where um, it, I had some interest and I was fascinated by Perry Mason. Uh, my real passion was in education, and so um, you know I pursued that initially. At the time, though, when I was pursuing my master's from ed- in education from Columbia, I um, had, uh, like I said, a lot of exposure to the way that the law impacts every part of our society, and I began to view the law as sort of the most potent mechanism uh, to affect social change. Uh, And so that is what prompted me, and at the nudging of my advisor as well, but that is what prompted me to um, go ahead and go to law school. And how did you decide, you know, sort of what to pursue then post-school, right? Sort of career in education, career in law. How how did that go beyond school to um, professional life? 
initially there there wasn't much much thought given to it <laughs> um, i I had known for a very long time that I wanted to be an educator uh, and so I went to the University of Oklahoma with becoming a teacher on my mind i mean i you know like every college student, I think I changed my major maybe five or six <laughs> times so initially th- there wasn't very much thought given into sort of what my professional career would look like uh, but as I began to dig into education policy. I realized that the law was sort of my calling, if you will. And and I didn't know sort of what I would do. I didn't know if I would, you know, pursue uh, public interest law or, or, you know, be at a big firm where I am now. But I was very attracted to the idea of using the law as a way to really make an impact on people's lives. And so that's um, what sort of made me make the jump from education uh, to law. So since you mentioned that you are at a big law firm, Gibson Dunn, tell us how you got there. Walk us through a little bit your career history and why you joined the firm. When I was uh, in law school, I guess before I started law school, I was a member of the uh, Sponsors for Educational Opportunity Program, uh, which is a fantastic program that places uh, pre-law school students into uh, big law firms for a summer and then does some educational enrichment stuff and training programs. So my first summer I spent time at uh, LaBeouf, Lamb, Green, McRae, which ultimately became doing LaBeouf and you know, ultimately uh, became defunct. But uh, I spent uh, my first summer before law school there and got some exposure to big law, if you will. Um, I spent some time doing some transactional work, spent some time doing some litigation. My, my summer as a 1L, I spent time at LaBeouf, Lamb, Grimmick, Gray, and uh, Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, uh, where I worked for the general counsel, uh, Leslie Rosenthal, um, who was a phenomenal uh, boss, and she taught me a lot that ultimately I, I came back to, um, and we'll talk about in terms of the pro bono stuff that I do now. But after my 1L summer, I split my time as a 2L between Sherman and Sterling and uh, doing LaBeouf. It had actually become doing LaBeouf by then. And I also spent some time at the Legal Defense and Education Fund uh, in New York. So I I did not summer at Gibson Dunn. Uh, That was a long way for me to say that. I did not summer at Gibson Dunn. Uh, in the middle of the recession, my wife uh, wanted to return to the Dallas area, uh, and so I decided to apply to a few places out here in Dallas, uh, and I was fortunate enough to receive an offer uh, to join Gibson Dunn. Uh, when I interviewed here, I, I fell in love with some of the folks here, uh, some of the folks that I met. Um, the culture seemed very conducive to um, success, and um, frankly, the free market system I thought was um, unique and a lot would allow me to uh, sort of chart my own course and find my own passions uh, and and succeed on my own terms. Um, and the free market system that is uh, you know a system by which you know people here associates here aren't assigned work. Uh, you aren't a, you aren't assigned to a practice group. You get to decide what you want to do and seek out your own work. Um, you know build relationships with mentors organically. That the combination of the free market system and the people here uh, and the culture generally um, was really attractive, and that's why I joined Gibson Dunn. That's great. That ex- helps us explain not only why you joined the firm, but how you ended up in Dallas. So, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we move on, I want to follow up with something that you mentioned, because the general counsel at Lincoln Center is very well known. She's very prominent. And you mentioned that she was a phenomenal boss. So before we leave this, what makes for a phenomenal boss? What what aspects of that experience so resonate now that you would call her a phenomenal boss? Yeah, so um, she really did just have a, a genuine interest in uh, my, my professional development, but also a passion uh, for, you know, doing what's right and, and ensuring the vitality of uh, the organization. I distinctly remember um, she introduced me into this program that she developed, which she called Council's Council Program. And um, through that uh, effort, she would get associates and, and even partners at various law firms in New York City uh, to contribute a few hours uh, pro bono um, to you know helping uh, Lincoln Center uh, deal with the issues that the legal issues that um, the organization um, w- was confronted with, and um, I just I, I was 
very struck by not only her um, guidance and her uh, passion, but also uh, the network that she built and um, the impact that she had, in my opinion, throughout the city, such that you mentioned she's you know well-known, very prominent lawyer, but people genuinely seem to like her and want to work for her. Uh, and and she gave them opportunities, particularly associates gave opportunities that they otherwise would not have uh, received. Um, so I just I just found that whole uh, experience fascinating, and and um, I, I really did appreciate, and I still do appreciate uh, everything that she's done for Lincoln Center and and for me personally. Those are great qualities for anyone who works in a managerial, you know, capacity to, to keep in mind. So I think those are great lessons. So before we um, circle back to pro bono, tell us a little bit about your practice. What areas you focus on and your areas of expertise? So I'm a general commercial litigator. I think um, yeah, about 75, 80% of my work is uh, you know, class action work. So I've been doing class action defense work uh, since I rejoined the firm after my clerkship, I clerked in the Northern District of Texas uh, and for Judge Fish, uh, Ajo Fish, and then the Seventh Circuit for Judge Ann Claire Williams, who just recently uh, retired. But I'm a general commercial litigator with a primary focus uh, on class actions. Um, as I mentioned, about 75 to 80 percent of my practice uh, relates to class actions. I do some appellate work. It's a very small portion of my practice. Uh, When I first rejoined the firm after my appellate clerkship, the uh, proportion was probably flipped. I think I did maybe 75 to 80 percent appellate work. But I I like the interactive nature of uh, trial-level work. Uh, I like being around um, colleagues rather than being in a room in front of Westlaw. (laughs) So, uh, you know, I've I've found my calling in class action defense and and, and trial-level litigation work. Now, you also maintain an active and, I'll say, award-winning pro bono caseload. Why? What sparked your uh, passion and interest in pro bono and access to justice? A, a couple of things. I mean, first, I grew up with uh, almost nothing. And, you know, I saw, so I saw firsthand uh, the value uh, and the impact uh, of service to the community, particularly by those um, professionals who have um, some specialized skills or training and uh, can do something for folks that they might not otherwise be able to do for themselves. I also just generally believe that as a lawyer, all lawyers, we've been given an extraordinary gift, and we have an obligation to use uh, that gift to the betterment of society, however you define it, right? Whether it's criminal justice reform, uh, religious freedom, uh, you know, whatever the issue uh, it is that that sparks you or that you are passionate about, I do believe as lawyers we have an obligation uh, to use our skills to to further uh, those causes. Uh, And then finally, I think my time as a law clerk, both in the Northern District of Texas and in the Seventh Circuit, you know, I witnessed, again, firsthand sort of the, the difference that quality advocacy can make on the outcomes of cases. And, you know, Judge Posner, who just recently retired, has yeah. been talking a lot about um, how pro se's are treated in our um, judicial system. And I think, I think he's uh, 100% right. There are a lot of uh, meritless cases that are brought by pro se litigants or indigent litigants. But there are some that that actually do have some merit, and they just uh, need uh, the guidance uh, and and um, advocacy of, of a skilled attorney. You know, and it's unfortunate that our judicial system really isn't designed to be navigated by non-lawyers. Um, you know, so everyday folks uh, who need their disputes resolved are often tripped up by procedure. Uh, or the you know the technicalities of uh, form uh, of a brief, um, you know, or motions or deadlines, you know, things that uh, litigators take take for granted because we we understand it. It's sort of second nature. You know, you pull up the rules of civil procedure and you follow the rules. It's easy, right? But to non lawyers, it's it's archaic and and arcane. It doesn't really make uh, much sense. P- people don't really understand why uh, procedure. Uh, should frustrate their efforts to get a ruling on the merits. And so just that experience as a law clerk, I think, really opened my eyes to the value uh, that we can contribute um, to to individual litigants, but also to the courts um, 
by volunteering some of our time to help folks who uh, would otherwise be left uh, on their own to navigate uh, this this very complex uh, legal system. Great, great perspectives. And I'm so glad that you brought up the breaking news about Judge Posner, because I think it'll be fascinating to see uh, what he writes, what he does. And uh, since he's focused on this as his, you know, sort of seminal issue, it's it's going to be really interesting. That's right. And, and I will say, um, you know, the, the one thing about the Seventh Circuit that really surprised me uh, was this um, their effort, the concerted effort by the court to uh, screen um, some, you know, pro se appeals or um, even, uh, uh, you know, other appeals that, that aren't pro se where, you know, a lawyer uh, withdraws to see if there's some merit to these cases and appoint lawyers to, you know, to, to take them on. I, I wish that every court of appeals um, adopted a similar program because um, it, it really has made a uh, tremendous difference, I think, in, in people's lives because there are cases that would um, have, you know, not been either heard on the merits or, as Judge Posey mentioned, uh, sort of been rubber stamped because, uh, you know, a staff attorney didn't think, um, based on the pro se filings, that there was any merit there. But when it's assigned to a skilled attorney, usually an attorney at a big law firm, you know, the full weight of the firm uh, digs into the record, uh, tries to find whatever appealable issues there are, uh, and presents those in a clear and understandable way, and uh, ultimately it will, will secure a ruling on the merits of the issues in the appeal. So I think the pro- program that the uh, Seventh Circuit internally has is phenomenal, and I, and I really do wish that other courts of appeals take the same approach. So let's talk a little bit more about this. You were very instrumental in developing um, an informal pro bono appellate program at the firm with the Seventh Circuit. So tell us about your role and what that's meant for for the pro bono at the firm. Right. So uh, part of this is just borrowing from what the Seventh Circuit does internally. So like I mentioned, the Seventh Circuit – uh, has a volunteer attorney panel uh, or program, which basically you can, you know, submit your name and um, b- be on a list to, um, you know, take on appeals uh, pro bono uh, as appointments are needed. Oh, when I got to the Gibson Dunn, uh, again, going back to the free market system, I was thinking about how can I um, chart my own path uh, to do some pro bono work and, um, you know, we talked about Leslie Rosenthal uh, at Lincoln Center earlier uh, and the Council's Council program, but um, that really is sort of what I borrowed from, right? The idea that we could provide an extraordinary service to individual litigants in the court by us lawyers at Gibson Dunn, particularly uh, associates here, donating some of our time, uh, taking on some of these cases, briefing them and arguing them to the extent that there's oral argument, and also give our associates an opportunity uh, to develop uh, because so many uh, young lawyers at Gibson Dunn and I think at big law firms everywhere are clamoring for opportunities to stand up uh, in court uh, to litigate cases either in trial or on appeal uh, and really take ownership of them and so there's a perfect intersection of interest, right, where the uh, individual litigants and the court uh, need assistance. They need someone to help uh, shepherd these appeals uh, through this complex appellate process and identify the, the uh, relevant issues and, and advocate on behalf of, of, of those issues uh, as zealously as possible. And associates at, at law firms um, and associates here at Gibson Dunn have an interest in, in uh, taking on these cases. And so what I tried to do when I got back to Gibson Dunn was offer uh, associates the opportunity uh, to take on these cases by tapping into the network that I built while I was at the Seventh Circuit and, you know, building on relationships that I'd made when I was a clerk um, was able to, uh, you know, build a sort of pipeline, if you will, where we get a a fairly steady stream of uh, cases to uh, potentially take on. And um, I have a, I think we have a, um, 
you know, a, a, a nice list or a, a fulsome list of attorneys here at Gibson Dunn who are willing to take these cases on. So my role really is just matching them up. I mean, I'm not, I don't think there's any, anything particularly uh, uh, special about that, but, uh, but, it, but it has been useful to uh, help um, associates here get those opportunities. Yeah, I think the intersection of pro bono and professional development is quite important, and I think you explained why very eloquently. Tell us a little bit about Rashad Imani. Right. Mr. Imani is a Wisconsin state uh, prisoner uh, who was convicted for armed robbery and uh, a few other things, but he was convicted after a trial in which he had asked to represent himself, um, but was denied that opportunity uh, because the Wisconsin State Trial Court didn't think essentially that he would do a good job because he's not a lawyer. Unfortunately for the Wisconsin Trial Court and, and the appellate courts as well, the Supreme Court has, has basically said that you can't think about whether the, the uh, individual litigant who seeks to represent him or herself uh, will be a skilled advocate. If they are competent, they should be allowed to represent themselves. Now, obviously, there are some restrictions. You know, you have to still abide by the rules and things like that. But uh, so Mr. Imani was convicted of armed robbery in a trial in which he wasn't allowed to represent him himself. Uh, he uh, filed a habeas petition after exhausting his state court appeals. Um, the habeas petition was denied in the district court. And uh, once it got to the Seventh Circuit, I was contacted about potentially uh, taking on the appeal. I actually have some interest in uh, criminal justice reform, and I've done a few uh, habeas appeals and uh, direct criminal appeals. So it was a a perfect match for me, and Mr. Imani was an extremely great client. I mean, he uh, had a lot of uh, thoughts and uh, was was very well-read in the law. Frankly, I don't know how the – uh, the trial court thought he wouldn't do a good job because you know he knew a lot uh, about law. He, he knew more about law than some than some lawyers. So we got the case when it was in the Seventh Circuit, and and obviously I had uh, a few other colleagues here at the firm who helped out with that case, uh, and we were able to reverse the district court's uh, denial of, of Mr. Amani's habeas petition and uh, get Mr. Amani a, a new trial. Do you have any takeaways or reflections from your experience uh, representing Mr. Imani and working on his case? I do. You know, I, I mentioned uh, in Jeff that I, I, I didn't know uh, why the, the trial court thought he couldn't represent himself because he, he seemed to me to know a lot more about the law than some lawyers. And, and I think that's, that's a, a pretty good takeaway. That is, uh, you know, pro se litigants, uh, individual litigants who um, cannot afford an attorney, you know, they're not they're not all, you know, incompetent. I mean, uh, there are a lot of folks out there who are, um, you know, intelligent. They just don't know the procedure or the, they don't, they can't navigate the rules of civil procedure or criminal procedure because they haven't had that exposure to them. Uh, and so, uh, one takeaway for me was, you know, just because someone is a, uh, indigent litigant or a pro se, uh, it doesn't mean um, that they can't advocate on on their own behalf. And I do think there's a role to play for people who you know have a background in law, who who have gone to law school and are practicing lawyers, uh, where there are particularly complex issues to navigate that um, you know uh, our training or our skills um, you know best prepares us to to resolve. But um, the takeaway for me was don't judge a book by its cover. You shouldn't presume that uh, pro se or individual indigent litigants representing themselves, um, that that, that their cases have no merit because that just simply uh, isn't the case. That's a great lesson and a great reminder. What do you say to busy law firm lawyers who don't think they have the time to get involved with pro bono? I would say they're wrong. (laughs) (laughs) I think – Time, we're all restricted by time, but if you're passionate about something uh, and you you find something that you, uh, a cause that you really want to advocate on behalf, uh, you'll make time. And so for me, as an associate at Gibson Dunn, I spent a lot of time on the weekends, for example, um, you know, doing pro bono work. I would usually reserve some time on the weekends or late at night where um, I would, you know, dedicate 
uh, an hour here or two hours there uh, to working on a brief or doing research related to a, a pro bono case. So if you find a cause that you're passionate about, if you find something that really interests you and you really do want to give back, you will make time. Uh, it can be an hour a day. It could be a weekend a month. Depending on the, the type of pro bono work that you're doing, uh, pro bono doesn't require all of your time. Uh, it only requires, you know, a little bit of it. And, and surely uh, you can make time uh, to give uh, back uh, to folks who need it. What motivates and inspires you? There are a few things that motivates and inspires me. First and foremost, it's the sort of desire to be just a good person, right? I mean, we all have our faults, and, uh, you know, I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I do try to be a good person, uh, and I do try to um, help folks who who need it. Uh, I think part of that is rooted in uh, my background and receiving the uh, assistance of uh, uh, people who could afford to uh, provide that assistance when I was younger uh, left an uh, imprint on me. But I also think there's something about a legacy uh, that motivates and inspires me, and that is even if no one else knows uh, about you know what my legacy will ultimately be, I do want people to remember me as someone who tried to help out. And so, you know, I want my, my children to be proud of me. You know, I want my, my wife to be proud of me, my family to be proud of me, my colleagues, and, and not proud because of my own personal achievements, um, but proud because I didn't waste my time thinking only about myself, but instead try to do something to help others. I hear our better angels calling, and I'm going to remember that that, uh, message that you just gave us for the rest of the day, the week, and beyond. That's that's, that's good stuff. I'm I'm fired up. Could you share some additional stories about pro bono matters that you've been involved in or witness that have been particularly meaningful to you for whatever reason over the course of your career? Tell us a few stories. Absolutely. I should say that, you know, Gibson Dunn as a a firm uh, more generally has been at the forefront of some of the most uh, important legal issues uh, in the public interest pro bono space. Um, And and it is one of the reasons why I really do appreciate the opportunity uh, to be a lawyer at this firm. Uh, So, you know, everything from marriage equality uh, to the, you know, the immigration uh, issues that are going on right now. Uh, this firm does not shy away um, from from stepping up to do what's right. And in my own personal capacity, um, there are a couple of cases that uh, you know I, I just feel very proud of because of you know people at this firm and, and you know either uh, work with me or um, on their own uh, advocated for causes that that are near and dear to my heart. So, yeah, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, you know, one example is we had this case here in Texas in our Dallas office on behalf of an organization uh, that builds um, houses for low-income people in the Dallas area. And uh, they were sued by uh, someone who purchased the house uh, that the, the organization built because the, the house ended up having a few very minor issues, but uh, the facts actually revealed that those issues were caused by you know a lack of maintenance. But this, this lawsuit really did put the organization on uh, the brink of you know disaster. I mean, not only did the lawsuit uh, seek an extraordinary amount of damages, but it but it also um, raised issues about uh, the uh, the organization's ability to get credit because there was a you know pending litigation against it, and so it, uh, it was it was a you know a, a very uh, unfortunate uh, situation where the organization tried its best to help this homeowner, wanted to go out and you know do all these repairs for free, but the the homeowner had felt you know, wronged by this, by this nonprofit organization. And, and essentially it felt like wanted to, wanted to, uh, to, to take it down. You know, so we were able to, uh, uh, help the organization out in that, in that case. And, um, we ultimately won summary judgment, but, but I think the, 
what the reason why that case sticks out to me is because even after uh, you know we prevailed on summary judgment, we were able to help that homeowner um, you know reconcile his differences with the organization, and the organization still went out there and made some of the repairs that the the homeowner had asked for. Um, you know, that kind of case uh, sticks with me because it shows like yes, we you know we have. Um, litigation that can be oftentimes be contentious, um, that can be um, existential, right? For for certain organizations, both um, you know for profit companies and nonprofits. But at the end of the day, most people are trying to do what's right. And so, even though we prevailed on summary judgment, here is this organization whose mission it is to help low income residents in Dallas doing what's right, uh, even though it won on the merits. Uh, in this litigation, it went out and made these repairs for this homeowner. So that was a, that was a great case. Another case that I'll just mention very briefly is uh, the Miguel Perez appeal. It was my first appeal uh, in the Seventh Circuit uh, Court of Appeals after my clerkship. Uh, the first case that I had taken on and briefed and, and argued by myself. Um, and uh, that case uh, involved uh, um, a prisoner who had been injured uh, during a basketball game in the prison, and uh, his injury was uh, basically ignored for an unusual and um, extraordinary amount of time. Mr. Perez, you know, sued the prison and various prison officials uh, under the First Amendment and Eighth Amendment for you know cruel and unusual punishment and retaliation for filing various grievances. Um, the prison and the prison healthcare officials had. Uh, ignored the injury at the out- outset and then ignored the uh, advice of a uh, specialist who had requ- uh, requested or required surgery or at least some kind of splint for Mr. Perez's injury to his, he injured his hand. So, you know, we took on that case uh, pro bono in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. The district court had dismissed his claims under the uh, Prison Litigation Reform Act so it, it screened his, his claim, screened his complaint, and found you know no a failure to state a claim, you know no no basis for him to recover under either of the claims that he had alleged. Um, the, I, this opinion strikes me. The opinion that we were able to secure from the Seventh Circuit strikes me, and it, it has stuck with me because uh, not only did we prevail on the first and uh, Eighth Amendment issues in terms of uh, Mr. Perez's stating a claim against the various prison officials. But it also raised an interesting question about recruitment of counsel. Mr. Perez had sought appointment of counsel uh, in the district court, and that request was denied, uh, even though the issues raised by his complaint, his pro se complaint, were very complex. And the Seventh Circuit had previously said, you know, when you're dealing with complex cases, particularly prison litigation or prisoners' rights litigation that have some aspect of uh, deliberate indifference or, or, or um, failure to provide sufficient medical care, you know, those are cases that are ripe for appointment or recruitment of counsel. And in the Perez case on appeal, the Seventh Circuit issued an opinion that was very, very robust on the need to recruit and appoint counsel in these types of cases. And I, I really, I felt, I felt really good about that one because, you know, we talked about just posing and pro and pro se's earlier, but I felt like the the court recognized in that case. Here's a complaint that was dismissed at the screening stage that has merit. And all of this could have been avoided if you had just recruited counsel. And again, you know, there are so many lawyers in you know, various law firms who are eager to take these cases on, uh, to take ownership of them. And um, you know, so folks are lined up at the door to take this case. And uh, the, the, we, the Seventh Circuit reached the right result, but also gave some very uh, uh, pointed advice to the district court to to recruit counsel in these types of cases going forward. <laughs> That's that's such a great matter, and it's such a great bookend from robust appointment of counsel on one end to the right to represent yourself on the other right. end. It's it's an interesting <laughs> cottage industry you've developed. So that's you know that's really fantastic, Andrew. If you had a magic wand, what one thing would you change about access to justice? If I had a magic wand, I would wave it and assure that every civil litigant has an attorney. Uh, so, you know, I know there's a civil Gideon movement and, you know, I know that is, 
often a contentious debate. And I don't think that this should be judge made by any stretch of the imagination, but there are certain areas of the law where, you know, people's livelihood is really at stake and it might not be, you know, a term of imprisonment, but, um, you know, their, their life savings or their access to their children or mental health is at stake. And at least in those cases, I think, uh, as a baby step, and I know some states are doing it on their own or have been doing it on their own for a while, but uh, at least in those circumstances, I think there should be something equivalent to a, um, you know, a civil Gideon uh, right. Uh, but if I could wave the magic wand, I think all uh, litigants would have uh, an attorney because, uh, again, there are so many instances in which you know, either an attorney can at the front end help uh, folks realize that their claims don't have merit or uh, they can find the merit in, in, uh, in, in those complaints or in those uh, disputes and present them in a, a digestible form such that the court will rule on the merits rather than dismissing because of technicalities. That is a great use of the magic wand. Let's let's <laughs> end with this. Other than Leslie Rosenthal, who we've heard a lot about, who is your pro bono role model? Feel free to pick more than one and why. So I don't think I can talk about role models in the law without mentioning, you know, the folks at the forefront of the civil rights movement. I mean, I just, you know... Uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall, Jack Greenberg, uh, you know, who uh, recently passed away. He was one of my professors at uh, Columbia Law School. All of the folks associated with the Legal Defense Fund, um, you know, those are the people who inspired me and continue to inspire me today uh, to to make an impact on society. In terms of contemporary role models, I mean, there are people at our firm who – are extraordinarily well-known, extraordinarily busy, but still make time for pro bono. So Ted Boutros is, you know, one of those folks. Um, Jim Ho in our office. Um, you know, my mentor, Veronica Lewis, here in the office, um, finds time to either, you know, do it herself or supervise, which is another role that lawyers can play. Uh, you know, partners at various law firms, you might not have time to take on a case by yourself, but you can supervise the associates who want who want to do so. Uh, and then, I, you know, frankly, uh, the folks, the associates um, here at Gibson Dunn uh, who have volunteered their time, um, who have helped to make this, uh, you know, program that, that we created here in the Dallas office of Gibson Dunn uh, in connection with uh, the Seventh Circuit um, taking on those appeals, those associates who have volunteered their time, I mean, you know, they're doing research and, and running down issues um, and they're not, you know, they haven't graduated yet to get up and take one of these cases on their own and go argue it in, in the court of appeals. But I think they're inspirational and they're sort of role models to me because, you know, they, they're trying to pitch in. Uh, and so I really appreciate that too. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. And thank you so much for talking with me today and for all of the amazing work that you're doing. It's, it's been a pleasure having you on our show. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much to Andrew for making the time to be with us and for all the inspiring work he does. You can learn more about the Pro Bono Institute on the web. Find us at probonoinst.org. Hey, listeners, we've gotten some great mail from you, and we love even more. Send your comments, feedback, and suggestions to probono at probonoinst.org. For all of us here at PBI, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Pro Bono Happy Hour.